Hi everyone, welcome back to Tokyo on Fire. Today is April 10th, 2018. The Japanese Ministry of Defense is suffering from a couple of scandals over the last couple of days, and they're going through something of an introspection of what the role of civilian control is with this core of Japanese defense internally and externally throughout the world. Today my guest is Benjamin Rimlin, who is a specialist in the U.S.-Japan defense policy area, and he's joining us today to talk a little bit about this issue. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. So as we all know, the uh, Article 9 prevents the Japanese from having an excursionary force. They can't have military forces in, in foreign lands. But through a reinterpretation of Article 9, they were able to send peacekeeping forces to the South Sudan and also to Iraq a couple of years ago, and this has been going on for a couple of years, and the logs, the defense logs of what's going on there, how hot is the area that our personnel are going into, is it still within the terms of the interpretation that we granted, facilitating you know, better relations with the United States and other, other allies, that's under scrutiny now, and the logs that say, perhaps, um, this is a hot zone and we were fired at 15 times and two people got almost wounded, those have been, some, in some cases, redacted, and others have just been hidden away. And the fact that they have been hidden for many years, for two years at least, have been kind of out in the open, and that's the scandal that we're experiencing now. That's exactly right. So Japanese doctrine as to the uh, sending of uh, ground self-defense forces, other members of the self-defense forces, on peacekeeping, peacekeeping operations has changed dramatically over the past 20 years since the passage of the PKO law uh, in order to send Japanese peacekeepers to Cambodia. Right. Uh, these do the doctrine have changed to the point where initially Japanese SDF forces were only capable of performing rear area logistics operations, right. things like construction of bridges, other kinds of uh, logistics supplies to now, uh, under the 2015 security laws, the so-called Kaketsuke Keigo doctrine, uh, so-called rushing to the rescue, in which Japanese SDF forces on peacekeeping missions are now able to discharge their weapons in protection of their own safety and in protection of other peacekeeping forces or even uh, NPO and NGO members assigned to that particular zone. Mm -hmm. so, so what's the problem in the case of the, the scandal that's currently happening in the diet? So it's actually kind of unclear because it seems that on a day-to-day -day basis almost, the story behind this document retention scandal seems to change. New details emerge from the woodwork. We found more. Exactly. Yes. Um, so just today, actually, there is a report in NHK about uh, how the uh, MSDF and the ASDF, so the Maritime and Air Self-Defense Forces, ordered by the Defense Ministry's Chief of Staff to look for logs pertaining to uh, operation of peacekeeping forces in South Sudan, how they did not actually go about this process. Mm -hmm. Well, the headline might have seemed a little bit damaging to the SDF uh, in that context. If you peeled a little bit back and looked a little bit further into the article, what became clear and what stood out to me in this article was that um, even NHK admitted that the, the direction from the uh, Defense Ministry's Chief of Staff to look for these reports was quite vague. Yeah. Uh, the, look, look, look over there somewhere. Mm. Right. It was quite vague. Uh, in fact, the you know the SDF uh, was not particularly was not especially ordered to report on these logs. They were ordered to double check that the logs that uh, Defense Minister Yunot had said were deleted were in fact not deleted. If they had you know somehow been misplaced, uh, and they were also ordered furthermore to take measures to preserve these documents for a longer period of time than they had been in the past. Mm -hmm. Um, so the NHK article concluded by saying that the directions to the MSDF and to the ASDF were perhaps a little vague. And maybe instead of some kind of pernicious conspiracy that might have uh, come about by a cabal of scheming SDF officers, this might have just been a case of bureaucratic mishap. Oh, but the thing is about the, just the maintenance and the, the destruction of documents. Hmm. Uh, the defense ministry in particular got in trouble many years ago with, with Mor the Moria scandal, where many of the procurement logs and the, the, the details of procurement contracts uh, were destroyed at the order of the vice minister. Uh, and that he was covering up his tracks, which included getting kickbacks and getting right. golf clubs and getting mm -hmm. visits to the golf course for himself and his wife, uh, that he was getting perks from all of this. The, the, so that here we are m many years down the road, uh, again, uh, and during an Abe administration, and the same problem reemerges of the mishandling of, of documents. Now, it's also coming in the context of a general uh, 
sense, or at least what has been indicated by the National Archives, that we're, we run out of space. And we have to start destroying things in order to make space for the records uh, that are being generated, uh, which is yet another scandal. You know, how are they going to judge what is being to, going to be destroyed? Why don't they build just another building? You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. building huge construction, having the huge construction pro projects out in the countryside is one of the things that supposedly the LDP is really good at. Why don't they make one of those projects a new depository? Uh, so it's not just a vagueness, it's in a context of documents uh, not being handled in accordance with the public interest. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, but we still don't know from the reports you know, whether this is a problem on the part of the various bureaucracies within the SDF itself. Um, so for instance, uh, the reports in recent days have been the Iraq logs coming to, uh, coming to light. The Iraq logs were produced at a time uh, in which the General Staff Office, the JSO, was not a uh, on a separate and uh, you know level above the maritime staff office, the ground staff office, the air staff office, the individual leadership of the services. And it's possible that in the reorganization of the defense agency to now the defense ministry, the elevation of the joint staff office to now being the supreme uh, command of the uh, SDF, that these documents could have been mishandled. In fact, I've spoken to uh, a number of individuals uh, from U.S. Forces Japan who've talked about their own document uh, log retention over at USFJ. And they've told me stories about how uh, when they came to USFJ, only a few years after Operation Tomodachi, tracking down logs from the you know, U.S. forces regarding operations in Operation Tomodachi was a nightmare in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So retention of documents and that context is absolutely well taken. And it's entirely possible that there could come you know, more damaging revelations to light, which could paint the SDF, the defense bureaucracy, in a far more unflattering light. But I think, speaking where we are right now, I don't think we can quite make the conclusion that there is yet some kind of vast conspiracy right. to, uh, to keep these documents uh, away from either the defense bureaucracy or from the diet. But it mm -hmm. looks so very bad. First of all, the, the number of international activities that are taken on by the U.S. State Department is not comparable to what the SDF does. The SDF has one, in this case, it was the South Sudan or the Iraq uh, with, with some uh, elements having to do with the Afghanistan refueling mission. But never is there really a vast corpus of material to be handling. It's generally only one or two international missions. So you, you, it's, it, while it, you can make that argument possibly for the United States, which is engaged in a global uh, sense, on multiple fronts, dozens of countries all over the world. Here in, in the SDF knows that the people want to know about this, knows that it's important, that they mishandle the documents anyway, looks like malfeasance, mm -hmm. not just incompetence. Yeah. Well, to be sure, obviously, as you said, the US is, of course, engaged in operations all around the world. But documents that are particular to USFJ ostensibly stay within that particular bureaucracy. So if we're looking from the, the perspective of folks working within that bureaucracy, Logic would have it that you know operations within it are kind of easy to discover if they're within uh, that same sphere of operations. Um, so not only that, but kind of examining uh, you know the day-to-day -day operations of the SDF prior to uh, you know this, this, this peacekeeping responsibilities that they've had to undertake. Um, they've been sort of occupied with defensive Japan scenarios for decades now. And the question really within uh, the document scandal is kind of boiling down to you know, individual words within these documents, like battle or right. engagement. And the question now is, you know, to what extent, you know, even setting aside the document, uh, you know, the mishandling or not mishandling of the documents, uh, is kind of examining to what extent perhaps the, uh, the SDF now has a political responsibility because it has, um, it has to sort of obey the, uh, you know, the, the, the whims of the uh, Kaketsuke Keigo doctrine or the, uh, the national security laws because, you know, as we've mentioned, it's coming down to you know, very particular conditions on a day-to-day -day sure. basis that might change uh, from a Monday to a Tuesday. Well, this is big business for, for Japan and for the Japan um, industrial complex, right? And building weapons and, and putting those forces at risk. But it seems to me that the defense ministry needs to show that they are out of harm's way. And let's just say, through speculation, a soldier for, with the SDF forces was, was killed in action in Iraq or in South Sudan. 
that would change the entire complex. I mean, the country would go crazy. The, the soldiers would all be pulled back, don't you think? Absolutely. Right? Uh, and to be sure, I mean, I think that if there does indeed surface uh, you know, true concrete evidence of a conspiracy either on Inada Tomomi's team to, uh, to suppress re uh, release of the documents or within the uh, organization of the SDF itself within that bureaucracy to suppress the release of these documents sure. because indeed there was a battle our going on. Our funding's going to get withdrawn. Absolutely. We're going to be pulled out. That's, Certainly. Yeah, that would, that would hurt. But for me, I think looking at uh, the perspective of, of an American you know, viewing this, uh, what kind of bothers me is the, the label of this as, as yet another instance of a so-called crisis in civilian control. Right. And if I may split hairs a little bit, to me this is more reflective of tense civil military relations rather than necessarily a full-blown crisis of civilian control. Internal to the ministry. Perhaps more writ large, the relations between the SDF, so the uniformed soldiers themselves, the ministry at large, and the diet. Okay. So examining perhaps how this sort of pattern of behavior, how tense relations between uh, the uniforms and the suits, so to say, right. might uh, be explained and how we can prevent these kinds of, of uh, incidences going uh, ahead in the future. Because of course, as we know, uh, in response to this in the diet, Opposition members have either called for Onodera's head, they've lobbied accusations saying your civilian control is insufficient, uh, the control wielded by the, SDF, by the uh, LDP over the SDF is insufficient. I think rather than firing people and firing either members of the MOD, SDF, and hoping the problem comes away, creating a more sustainable relationship between the SDF, the bureaucrats, and the diet members who run the SDF and supply it with its budget and equipment is the way to go forward. Yeah. But the thing is about that, you, if, if the SDF hides documents uh, intentionally or uh, with, by interpreting the words of the minister in such a way as is most convenient to maintain secrecy, that does break down the image in the public of civilian control. And if you do that, one of the SDF's pet projects, which is getting an amendment to Article 9, which would make the SDF a fully constitutional, or at least it's constitutional in many people's views, but to put that line in the Constitution saying the, S the SDF is there for the defense of, of, of Japan, there's no way that's going to pass if the SDF has a pattern right. of behavior of hiding uh, the truth. There's n so they're shooting themselves in the foot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's kind of boil down to the issue here of why exactly there is a disconnect between the SDF, the bureaucrats, the public at large, and of course the diet itself. The question, I think, is understanding the role uh, that the SDF plays within Japanese society, understanding the uh, sort of image that the public has of the SDF. And I think here a little bit of comparison might help us kind of shed light on why the SDF might feel uh, mistrust when it comes to negotiating with the bureaucrats. I'm all ears. Suits. So in discussing this idea of a question of civilian control, uh, in, in Japanese defense discourse, we've had this kind of accusation lobbied against the SDF when reports of contingency planning on the Korean Peninsula emerged during the so-called Three Arrows incident in the late 1960s, in which SDF plans for a resumption of the Korean War were leaked to the media, the resulting furor over the fact that the SDF was planning was labeled a crisis in civilian control. Mm -hmm. uh, in the late 70s and the early 80s, uh, members of the Joint Staff Office uh, gave public comments in support of legislation uh, and in uh, sort of denigrating the so-called sensu boy, defensive defense doctrine that has been the foundation of the SDF's defense policy. Now, in the United States, in our context, a military officer giving their unvarnished advice on global issues, on the defense policy of the country that they serve, is considered completely normal. In the United States Congress, drawing the brass from the Joint Staff Office before the Congressional Committees on Armed Services is considered just any other Tuesday. Mm -hmm. But in Japan, if an SDF officer were called before the Diet to give their own unbridled, unvarnished testimony on Japan's defense policy, on the course of the SDF, on readiness issues, equipment procurement, it would cause people's heads to sure explode. Would. Right. So I think that understanding the, the you know, kind of the tensions that have emerged, the constant reliance on this term crisis of civilian control, not to mention the fact that SDF soldiers 
compared to militaries of other Western democracies, are paid very low. They're often made to switch assignments at the drop of a hat. I've heard stories from uh, some friends of mine uh, in U.S. forces Japan who relay anecdotes of, of Japanese officers, their colleagues, who are told to change assignments either across Japan or even around the world in some cases within a week's notice. Sure, happens in Japanese companies too. Absolutely. Yeah. So building a more sustainable relationship, I think, rather than simply saying it's a crisis in civilian control and demanding that uh, you know we have heads on a platter, I yeah. think would be a better way to build a more uh, trusting foundation between the SDF and the bureaucracy moving forward. I don't know. I think it's there's a love-hate relationship, mostly on the hate rather than the love with the, the Japanese population and the self-defense forces or the ministry of, of um, the, the defense ministry. Mm. Ichigaya, the Ichigaya, uh, the campus of the ministry is right down the street. And all of the officers who work there, they come in civilian clothes. They ride the trains, they maybe drive their cars, they walk to work, and they walk into the the, the compound and then they dress up in their, their uh, dress whites or, mm. or whatever their uniforms are. And when they finish work, they dress out again and come back into the population. So there's this, this disconnect that goes on, not, not only visually, but also psychologically. And I think that's the rub, that's part of the rub with the civilian control. And it seems to me that there's this tension, in, even inside the, the Ministry of Defense, where it is a male dominated, it is full of pride and patriotism. And here you guys are, you politicians, and you come in and you put a, a female in as the leader of, of our proud ministry and you know she she hasn't been groomed and grown in what the traditions are for for what we do for protecting the nation uh, th there seems to be some sort of you know psychological thing that's going on there hmm. I can't speak to how specific cadres of SDF officers may have responded to the appointment of uh, a Inada, minister right. Inada. Um, but absolutely. But Koike had been minister before, so mm -hmm. it's not like they didn't have, of course, it was only for a month, but still they'd had a woman as, as defense minister mm -hmm. before. And it was good. I mean, when, when she became def minister of defense, it was, it was news and it was a bright light. But nevertheless, you've got this, and this thing going on with the hiding of the documents, and she said, there are no documents. I've never found any documents. I've looked everywhere. And now, you know, a year later, it being shown that she was bamboozled. Well, no, it's not. I don't think so much as bamboozled as she. She definitely w didn't want them to be found, and so she just made her requests in such a way that they would not be. You, you have to remember also that how she got in trouble during the election, uh, when she went out and. Uh, campaigned and said, as the defense minister, as a representative of the SDF, vote for, vote this, for my guy, vote for my person. And everybody just jumped on her uh, for politicizing the SDF. And, and the she's a lawyer by training. And she's a lawyer. She knew what the law was. Right. Uh, so I don't th think it has really anything to do with gender. In fact, gender is one of the issues that the SDF really tries to work hard on mm -hmm. uh, in terms of trying to recruit as sure. many uh, women into this, the services, which is, the recruitment is very low, uh, but they're trying their best, sometimes ludicrous levels of, uh, uh, of attempting to appeal to women, so much so as to earn the, the, the laughing stock sta status in the rest of the world. Uh, but in terms of this particular scandal, it feeds into a sense that uh, is expressed throughout elsewhere that whatever happens under Abe, there's no, we, he cannot be trusted to make this transition. He cannot be the one who is going to lead the transition of the self-defense forces into something that is more expected. Mm -hmm. and, and remember, the, the ministry was established during his first term, mm -hmm. that, that he was the, the prime minister who created the, the ministry of mm -hmm. defense out of the defense agency. And he was the, the prime minister who, under his, under his first term, established the referendum process that will make it possible to re reform the uh, constitution when that it, when and if that ever happens. Nevertheless, the numbers, the attitudes, the, uh, the past, and these incidents involving these documents build a hard core within the Japanese electorate that will just say no to anything that approaches Maybe so. Article 9. Right. I think on a political level, I absolutely agree with you. And I think that you put it really well and that there's kind of a, a cadence to all of these document scandals, whether it's right. Kake, Moritomo, and now with the defense ministry, certainly in the eyes of an average Japanese voter who might not be up to date on the various ins and outs and nuances of the MOD bureaucracy versus the finance bureaucracy, Medi bureaucracy, absolutely. 
there is definitely this constantly echoed perception that the Abe administration doesn't quite know what it's doing with its documents. So mm -hmm. on a political level, I think you absolutely hit the nail on the head that it's only going to hurt Abe going forward. This Whether or not it comes out that it was a conspiracy on the part of the MOD, SDF, or in fact there's a more innocent explanation for right. it and that it was lost in the shuffle. Uh, I absolutely think that uh, Michael got it right in saying that uh, you know this this idea that the Abe administration can't quite keep its public documents in order mm -hmm. is only going to hurt them going forward. Right. Let me ask you a question though. This this transition that Michael mentioned, do do you agree that this is inevitable? The self defense forces needs to go through a transition. It needs to be um, of a of a breadth and of a depth and of a, a throwing power that it can defend the nations from enemies. Um, you know, even as far as uh, Iraq in, in coalition forces? Well, I don't know about Iraq specifically, but I think that absolutely the trend not only exists and is going, but is actually going to strengthen in the years ahead. Uh -huh. uh, so currently the defense bureaucracy in the, is in the midst of uh, reviewing and revising the National Defense Program Guidelines, the foundational document which outlines the threats facing Japan and in turn prescribes the uh, doctrine and strategies to counter these threats. Um, and we've all heard leaks in the media over the past few months regarding not just the NDPG, but the midterm defense program outline as well, which mm -hmm. is a separate document that prescribes the uh, systems that Japan will procure to execute these strategies. We've heard about um, procurement of aircraft carriers, the idea of turning the uh, Izumo class helicopter carriers into aircraft carriers. We've heard about the purchase of vertical takeoff and landing F-35s. The, the long-range missiles. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I think that, speaking in the near term, Japan is going to be kind of increasing its range, as you said, increasing its ability to project military power, not just in its own immediate neighborhood, but as Japan increases its capacity building programs in South and Southeast Asia, it's going to be bringing those forces along with it on these uh, diplom naval diplomacy mm -hmm. uh, trips as well. Right. I think the outgrowth, Michael, of, of this scandal that we're experiencing now will be in the diet hearings, the budget hearings for allocating uh, what, what the defense ministry is going to have for uh, their budget in uh, 2019. And maybe the repercussions will be seen then for, uh, for how much they are, they are allotted. It used to be that anything around 1%, uh, over 1%, cause a big brouhaha. What's the current situation now? Is it around 1%? They've exceeded that in a couple of years. No, they, they, they've that. exceeded it year and year, and each year the budget is larger. Uh, the problem is, is there's an absolute ceiling within the budget, about, which is around 6% of uh, the budget, that it's not even close to approaching right now. It's, it's above 5%, but to get to 6%, it then starts to have to eating into Thing, other things people like, mm -hmm. like social security or uh, construction projects or local government, all of which have much bigger slices and, and a much more, let's say, much more of a zing in terms of electoral politics. Defense is not an electoral politics winner. Very few people are interested in it. Very few people are interested in foreign policy. And so for the members of the Diet who eventually, you know, who are part of the budget process and who, in the absence uh, of any kind of centralized force uh, within the Conte, which Mr. Abe has been trying to put together, uh, they're going to get their projects in and none of them ever have anything to do with defense. Mm -hmm. So right. defense, if it wanted to really take on the roles that he's describing and that you're describing, would have to go from 5% to 10% of the budget and at that point, who are you going to sacrifice? Right. Well, it doesn't look like anybody's going to be voting for that anytime soon, especially with this particular scandal. Well, let's also remember back to the general election in October. I mean, we've all, you know, recall the posters with Abe uh, saying, you know, very prominently in large font, we're going to go on protecting this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember watching a Tokyo on episode, uh, Tokyo on Fire episode a few months ago in which we were talking about how um, Abe was able to kind of duck the first instanti instantiation of the Moritomo and Kakegakuen scandals by constantly referring to the threat from North Korea. Yeah. So as that threat only I saw that video too. As that threat only increases in the coming years, with the possibility of Trump making a deal to remove North Korea's intercontinental missiles, but still leaving in place the medium and short range right. missiles, it's possible that Japan could and the LDP could still have that uh, you know that that dead horse to continue beating uh, in the years ahead to to continue. Uh, referring to uh, defense policy as an, uh, a vote getter for the LDP. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Ministry of Defense, great turmoil, a lot of scandal going on. We're going to stay on top of this. You should too. Please stay tuned.
Hi guys, thanks very much for joining us in this session. Please don't forget to hit like, share, or subscribe, and join us in the discussion by putting your comments in the comment section below. We pay attention. Tim, I, d I, I don't think they've subscribed yet. No, they're just looking at the monitor.